governments around the world are going broke. We know that. We know that in the developed nations that they're in, you know, their mandatory spending is far exceeding what the money income that they have. In the United States, our deficit is about double what, uh, what, or about equal to what we're bringing in in tax revenue. So about three and a half trillion dollars of deficit. So the countries are broke. Um, a few hundred trillion of unfunded liabilities that they're going to have to pay for. Um, you know, in Canada, most of the developed world, we're still in a lockdown. I don't see the economy bouncing back right away. Um, we're still going to have businesses shut down. Um, more people are going to be out of work. And so what does all that tell us? There's a lot of uncertainty, but I think the one bit of certainty that we do have, there's more debt, more, more money creation. That's what's going to happen. What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation. And that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and I'm joined by Mark Moss. Mark, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Jay. Good to be with you today. Yeah, it's good to see you again. I'm glad to have you back on. So for those unfamiliar with Mark, Mark is the host of the Mark Moss YouTube channel, shows like Market Disruptors and others. Uh, Mark's a content creator in the macro world. And um, people like Mark are very valuable to people like me because I like to obsess over the small cap early stage sector. That's where that's my pocket. Um, but it's super important to identify and stay on top of macro trends that are creating the tailwinds or the headwinds that really affect that investment thesis. And so I'm not the macro expert. That's why I like to pay attention and talk to guys like Mark. Uh, like George Gammon and like a lot of the people that we have on this channel, they identify, help me identify blind spots, which is super critical as an investor. Um, now, it's important to note that, you know, all content is not created equal. And same as in my sector, there's lots of small cap investment pundits that just talk and don't actually have money in the market or skin in the game. And, and the macro world is just the same. There's lots of people that just create and sell fear narratives. Uh, Mark puts his money where his mouth is. And, uh, as an example, he's in Puerto Rico right now trying to figure out how to move his young family from California uh, to a better location. He does what he talks about. And I really appreciate that about him. So why don't we start right there, Mark? Uh, what, what, how spontaneous was this decision? What led up to it? And was there a final trigger point that convinced you, I got to take this seriously. I want to get out of California. You know, it's kind of like, um, like, like you said, like I'm, I'm living it. Right. So, um, you, you look at these people who like made it and they're like, oh my gosh, you're an overnight success. And they're like, yeah, overnight, but I've been working hard for 20 years. Right. So the, 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 the point where they had their breakthrough seemed overnight, but really they've been working at it for 20 years. So, you know, I've been living this for 20 years too, 25 years, right. In the trenches, um, you know, never really had a, a real job, uh, so to speak, right. I've basically been a full-time investor and, 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 and entrepreneur, you know, throughout that time. So, you know, I've been working up towards this my whole life, living this. And so, you know, I've spent the last couple of years talking about it more publicly on YouTube, but, but like I said, I've been living it. And so, um, this move you're talking about right now, I mean, I just got to, I got to Puerto Rico, like you said, moving my family out of uh, California. Um, it was abrupt, but it was something that I had been, had my eye on for five, six years, something my wife and I had talked about on and off throughout the years, we had started to really heat up the discussion about six, seven months ago, but didn't really uh, make any plans. And all of a sudden, like three weeks ago, we just said, you know what, let's just do it. And we, and we did, and we just left. So it was, it was, it was an overnight decision, but like I said, a long time coming. Right. Okay. And obviously from your standpoint, like far more favorable tax structure, we were talking about this stuff before he record, because you know, I'm Canadian, I'm fairly up to speed with the tax incentives, why you'd consider this move, but but you shed a bit more light on that now. I mean, it's an absolute trend, right? It seems like every every day there's a headline of somebody with a bit of wealth getting out of California. Texas is a major location people are traveling to. Um, so, so opening up the bigger picture, Mark, um, you know, a lot of the content you create is focused on a lack of trust in the Fed, a lack of trust in the U.S. dollar. Um, now, my audience is pretty up to speed on that. We've got some pretty intelligent resource investors. And if you come from the gold sector, you, you probably agree with that thesis. But um, what are you seeing, Mark? And, and how much do you think on a global scale, the civil unrest and the political unrest in the US is impacting the world's trust in our current reserve currency? 
Yeah, I mean, it, uh, 100% it is. Before I dig into that, I want to just say kind of uh, one thing that you said about uh, about this move and, and it's a growing trend. And so I do want to just say real quickly that you're right, it is a growing trend. And I believe it's it's one of the biggest macro trends out there. I've been calling it the great migration. And I believe that it really leads to the only thing that gives me hope for the future. And so um, if you if you step back and see what's going on in the world and you really pay attention to trying to um, pretend it's not happening, um, you'll realize that we're heading to a place that's not, <laughs> not very favorable for in most people's opinions. And I believe the only thing that saves us is the ability to move to places where we're treated better, which will lead to competition. So we'll see countries starting to compete for people. And only through that competition will break the grip of, you know, totalitarianism. And so, um, yeah, it is a trend that's just starting. It's a trend that's growing, as you just pointed out. Um, and I think it's the biggest and uh, most most important trend that we're that we're facing. Um, that being said, uh, back to your question, um, and 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 it, and it really leads into that, right? So you just talked about this this distrust or this mistrust, and we can see that all over the world, uh, people are losing trust and, and they're unhappy with their situation. Now, before the pandemic, if you just zoom out to, um, you know, beginning of, of 2020, we saw in about eight different countries, there was over a million people each protesting. So this was happening all mm -hmm. over the world. Um, the United States was kind of keeping it under wraps a little bit. Of course, when the pandemic came and sh shut all that down, uh, but, but it's continuing to go on. Everybody knows there's something wrong, but nobody can quite put their finger on it. And really, it just boils down to the money. The money system itself is so distorted that it's causing all these distortions in the market. It's causing this inequality to grow, right? We have this massive divide between rich and poor, bigger than we've ever had before. And I just put out a tweet uh, uh, maybe just an hour or two ago where I said that, uh, basically, to, to your point, I said that 100% of empires fail, 100%. And they always fail. And it always happens the same way where they inflate away, they debase, devalue their currencies to a point where the people no longer want it. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we see hyperinflation as the people dump the money. They don't trust it anymore. They don't want it anymore. It leads to that hyperinflation and it's the end of the currency. It's happened through history over and over and over again. And of course, we're just repeating the cycle again. And you didn't get close to that. So, you know, I, I can't help but think about the liquidity crisis in March when, you know, the world was hit with global uncertainty and people still fled to the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, what will be, are there any catalysts that you're looking at, Mark, that would change that behavior where the next, well, the next crisis we I have? Th I, think, I think there's a couple things, right? So if you're looking at just currencies on their own, um, the dollar is kind of the best house in a bad neighborhood is one way to look at it. Um, you have analysts like Brent Johnson pushing like the dollar milkshake theory. Um, and basically he's saying that the dollar is going to continue to get stronger and stronger. And it's going to suck up the liquidity of all the other currencies into the dollar as the dollar gets stronger and stronger and stronger. But what, what people miss about that whole theory is that the dollar is getting stronger, but compared to what? The, yeah. In his theory, the dollar is getting stronger to other currencies, but it's still losing purchasing power. And purchasing power is really what matters, right? What can I actually buy with those dollars? You could have a billion dollars in a briefcase on a deserted island, and what good does that money do you, right? So we need to have purchasing power. And so the dollar is getting stronger against currencies, but it's losing its purchasing power to things that really matter, which is goods and services, uh, real estate, obviously, commodities, gold, metals, things like that. Right. Okay. And so as an investor, Mark, like how, how are you playing that game, right? The devaluation of currency, inflated asset prices, how are you positioning yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, you can look back again on this global macroeconomic picture and uh, I always, you know, the, the, the quote's been used a million times, but it, it really is good. I mean, the great one, Wayne Gretzky always said, right, I skated to where the puck was going to be. And that's what that's what the macro picture does. It's, it's a top down approach. It's like if they're making these policies today, what is that going to mean down at the bottom as opposed to like stock picking? You're talking about, you know, micro caps. I mean, that's kind of a more of a bottom up approach. And so we know that um, the governments around the world are going broke. We know that. We know that in the developed nations that they're in, you know, their mandatory spending is far exceeding what the money income that they have. In the United States, our deficit is about double what, uh, what or about equal to what we're bringing in in tax revenue. So about three and a half trillion dollars of deficit. So the countries are broke. 
um, a few hundred trillion of unfunded liabilities that they're going to have to pay for. Um, you know, in Canada, most of the developed world, we're still in a lockdown. I don't see the economy bouncing back right away. Um, we're still going to have businesses shut down. Um, more people are going to be out of work. And so what does all that tell us? There's a lot of uncertainty, but I think the one bit of certainty that we do have, there's more debt, more, more money creation. That's what's going to happen. And so based off of knowing that, what does an investor do? Well, we know that when they can create an unlimited amount of fake fiat counterfeit money, it's going to push people to want to buy real, hard, tangible things. So the, the trade of the decade is going to be getting out of fake fiat market-driven um, assets and into real, hard, tangible assets, so commodities. Uh, commodities, you know, supplies, things like that. That can also be metals. Uranium, um, you know, gold and silver, obviously Bitcoin, which some people want to argue about that, but it's, it's a, it has a fixed market cap. So again, it can't be inflated away. Um, so I think those types of things as an investor, that's where I'm focused. And like, I, like I've really been calling it like the trade of the decade. And I, because again, I look at things from a bigger um, angle. Like if I can only make a couple of moves, you know, what are going to hold me over? And, it, and, and that's the assets that I'm looking at. Yeah. Okay. I, I completely agree. And I think I'm pretty aligned with that. You know, the way I'm playing this is allocating cash towards commodities, hard assets, Bitcoin, and some capital markets opportunities that are leveraged to the Bitcoin price, um, all which has served me. And I, I think that most of my audience is going to agree with that thesis, Mark. So a question I want to ask you is, do you see anything that could prove this wrong, that could change that tide and make this commodity sentiment incorrect? I, I don't really. And when I say I don't really, I mean, what would change the tide is would be the opposite, right? So all of a sudden tomorrow, the world leaders decide that they want to live on a budget and they're going to go into austerity and they're going to cut spending um, and they're going to decide to live within their means. That would obviously change it. But I just, just th the, the chance of that happening is, is uh, one in a million, you know? So um, short of that um, changing, I just don't see that happening. Um, you know, there's also a couple bigger things that are on the horizon. You know, there's the World Economic Forum talking about this great reset. The IMF is talking about this Bretton Woods 2 moment. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like these governments are kicking the can down the road until they're ready. They understand that a shift, uh, we, they understand the system has to be reset because they've run out of tools, right? What can a central bank do? They can create issue debt and they can lower interest rates. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the tools in their shed. Well, interest rates are at zero. So that tool's out. The only tool they have left is debt. And so they don't have many options. The game is up. They've changed the game. They changed the rules so many times. They're out of, of rule changes. And so now they just got to wait, make it wait a little bit longer until they can reset the system. So I don't, I don't see any other option. I think they have to just continue printing. Mm, okay. You know, what do you think happens when somebody gets into the, the seat, you know, the Fed chair? I just wonder because I... I it's it's easy to sit back and and look at the policy and be like what are they thinking they just keep kicking the can down the road towards a bigger end result like a bigger problem but then you have chairs like jerome powell who was incredibly hawkish and vocal about how he would not enact the exact policy that he enacted and sure you know no one could nobody could have forecasted what occurred last march and the cons you know the cons con the, the the next events but you know, what pressures do you think maybe are behind the curtain that we don't see? What would make somebody like Jerome Powell pivot so dramatically other than maybe it was just the market crash, et cetera? Well, I mean, we've seen that over and over. I mean, Bernanke uh, before him was also wrote many papers a long time ago talking about how bad inflation was and, and the dangers and stuff like that. So they always come in with that. But then once they get in the chair, they just want to print whatever they can. And, and I would say what it really comes down to <laughs> I, I always say that everything comes down to the money and uh, almost every problem that we see in society comes down to the money. That the fact that we're off of this, uh, of a sound money into this fake fiat money. And mm -hmm. so what it's done is it's put everybody into short term thinking. And so we see this in politics as a perfect example, right? Everybody's only focused on getting reelected that next election, the next election. Next. So, so all the decisions they make are short-term thinking. And um, I think Jerome Powell is no different, right? Like instead of going, shoot, like if we don't change right now, things are going to be really bad. Even though it's going to be bad if we change now, it's going to be less bad than it will be if we wait. 
but they can't think like that. They, 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 they can't have it. No politician, no central banker can allow anything bad to happen on their watch because they're only focused on the short term and they can't focus on the long term because they're focused on reelection all the time. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. um, it's, it's the shift in short term thinking. And, and, and I say it's not just politicians and bankers. I mean, it's all through areas of life. You know, I decide to eat cheesecake and, uh, and pizza every single night because it tastes good right now without thinking the long term consequences. Right. Or I'm going to go ahead and spend more and take on a bunch of debt for my own household without thinking of the long term ramifications of that. Um, and so it's a problem all throughout society that I think the fiat money system has really instilled into people. Mm-hmm. We're in this Keynesian money system that teaches we have to spend, 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 spend. Don't save. Forget saving. Right. Savings, long term thinking. We have to spend, spend, spend. And so uh, we see that all through areas of life. And, and I think the Fed as well. Yeah. Okay. It makes sense to me. I can't say I disagree. So let's talk about action, Mark. When you think forward 2021, talk to my audience about how you're allocating cash, how you're hedging your bets. What are you doing? So the, the big thing that I would say is, is, is maybe it's one or two things kind of wrapped into one is, is that, you know, 2020 was unpredictable. A lot of things happened that nobody expected. 2021, obviously, the, the future is uncertain as well. Um, I do believe what's certain is money printing. That's that's pretty certain. But how will that affect the market? Um, a lot of analysts are predicting the 60%, 70% crash next year. And then we run into mass inflation. Some are predicting that we just go straight into inflation without having to crash. And so we don't really know. So what I would say, uh, what I'm doing and the advice that I would give anybody is, one, now is the time to be paying attention. Now is not the time to be giving your money to some money manager, put into a 60, 40 plan and playing the long game that those days are over. Uh, the, the, the world we're going into is not the world that we, that we've left behind. And so first I would say, look, you need to be paying attention and you have to be ready to pivot. You have to be ready to take in new information and change your strategy. So that's the first thing, be ready to pivot. But, um, based off of where we're at right now, as I already said, right, commodities, gold, silver, Bitcoin. I mean, those are the places to be. Um, um, I think there's still some income plays. It obviously depends on what your goals are, but when it comes to growth, it's really those, those categories, you know, precious metals, commodities, and, and Bitcoin is where I'm putting my money. I think that, um, like I said, as they continue to print more money, it's going to continue to push more people into those assets. So yeah. that's, that's, that's my plan for 2021. I'm with you. I mean, I think one of the most important things you said there was just the, the importance of people taking control, right? Yeah. Don't hand your account to a fund manager and expect great results. You got to, yeah, it's time to put yourself in the driver's seat now more than ever. I got a reference, a tweet you sent out on uh, New Year's Eve that I just loved. It says, if you are a freedom loving, sovereign individual who believes in liberty and personal responsibility, then you are at war, not with weapons, but with money and information. Defund the opposition and arm yourself with knowledge. Share and wake up more soldiers. The time is now. I loved it. That oh. fired me up. And it encompasses like, you know, kind of the the, the narrative that, that I promote that you absolutely promote, which is personal sovereignty. Take control. Yeah take control. Yeah. It's all up to you. Def- definitely. I must have been filling the fire that night when I decided to send that out. But you know, the thing that the, the reason why I really sent that out and, and why my mindset is there is that again, right? When we look out in the future, it's not good. Like if you look at the plan they have for the world, <clears throat> it's not good. If you look at the plan that the Canadian leaders have for you, it's not good. Um, and so I see it all the time. I get 5,000 comments a week across my media platforms. And, and, uh, and, and all the, all the comments are like, oh, they're going to outlaw Bitcoin. They're just going to outlaw gold. They're, they'll never allow this. They're only going to do this. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not victims. Mm. The future is ours to create. If a billion people don't want that to happen, then it's not going to happen, right? Stop being a sheep. And like, let's go create the future that we want. The government is supposed to be there for the people to serve the people. And obviously that's changing really rapidly, but it was, uh, it was a point where like, look, man, the future is not good. And if you don't want that time to wake up right now, tell other people and, and speak up. And so, um, and, and, and to, to your point, I open up most of my YouTube videos where I just say that like, no one's coming to save you. You need to take responsibility for yourself. And I focus on the money, not because I want to stack up a bunch and be greedy, but because wealth gives us options, mm-hmm. just like me. I flew over here to this country because I had money. I could do that. And so you need to have those options in life. 100%. Okay, let's let's dig into some details with, you. Know, we talked about gold, silver, Bitcoin. So uh, one by one, I'd just love you to share a little bit on your strategy. 
starting with gold. How, how do you invest in gold, Mark? So I became a gold bug in uh, about a dozen years ago in the great financial crash of 2008. Um, I had made a lot of money. I was really good at making money, but I didn't understand this financial casino <laughs> and I, and I got, I got, I got kind of wiped out. So I had to really dig in deep, vowed to never let that happen again. And I learned it was all about the money system coming off of sound money, coming off of gold created all these problems. Mm. And so I became a gold bug and, and I still love gold today. Uh, my strategy with gold today is, you know, really, I look at it, you have two ways to play it. Really, I break it down into physical, right? I can own physical gold. And so I can buy it, I can take delivery of it, or I can store it in a, in a vault somewhere else. And that's really, you know, end of world doomsday scenario. If all the world goes to hell in a handbasket, I have my physical gold, um, you know, and it depends on your situation. Some people don't have an environment where they can store physical gold themselves. So in that case, you might want to have a, 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 a say, you know, some sort of a storage vault, hold it for you. You might want to actually have some stored in different jurisdictions. So some in Singapore, some in London, some in the United States, et cetera. So, so physical gold is one way I look at it. So if I looked at all the money that I, I have, and then of all the liquid investable money I have, how much do I want to de dedicate to gold and precious metals? I call it chaos hedge insurance. Mm. And then of that, let's say half of that I want to put into physical or 30% I want to put into physical. The rest, I, I like to play with gold miners and silver mining stocks. And the reason why I like those is because they give me leverage to the price of gold. So if gold goes, I think gold could easily go to 23, 2,500 bucks here in the next couple of months. So that's, you know, four or $500 bump from where we're at right now, which is pretty good. But a gold miner who has 5 million ounces of gold in the ground, 5 million ounces times three or 400 bucks, that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden we can get multiples on that gold. We could see 20, 30, 50 times returns. Uh, easy to get triple digit winners in the gold and silver mining space. Um, in that mining space, I would break it up into kind of majors and minors, uh, or juniors, I should call them majors and juniors. Um, and so, um, you know, I think, I don't know if you want to dig in deeper than that, but I think each person kind of needs to find their comfort level, their risk tolerance 100%. and figure out how much they want to put into each of those two sectors. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I tend to be pretty spec in my portfolio, but, um, yeah, it's it's definitely a high risk business for sure. Now, I want to. I see. I do see. I do see a lot of people that comment though. You know, are like, oh, you can't buy gold miners. You can only own physical. Only physical counts. And only physical counts in that Mad Max in the world scenario where you <laughs> only have gold in your safe and that's it. Yeah. Um, but a lot of us still are trying to get multiples return to grow that value that can, of course, then be turned back into physical later. Um, and so that's the strategy of, of using both of those. Yeah, hundred percent. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And when you make those profits in the spec market, how do you reinvest? So you, you know, you you place some high risk bets. You know, they were correct. Yeah. You take your profits. Are you then putting into physical, into Bitcoin, into real estate? Where where are your profits going? Yeah. So um, I, I I started my career as a real estate investor, and I started buying bank repos, fixing them, and flipping them. And I probably did I don't know 100, 150 uh, fix and flips over over a decade. Um, and, and then I started buying uh, rental properties and some of the best properties that I was fixing and flipping the ones I liked, I would just keep them. So I was doing a bunch and then I'd keep one, do more, keep them. And then I was making income, right? Each time I flipped the home, it was income. And then I would pile up that income and then buy a gold apartment building. And so I'd keep some and, I, and, and, uh, gold's kind of the same way where I want physical gold, but I can use gold miners to increase my U S dollars, which then I can convert back into more gold. Got so that's it. kind of the strategy strategy. Um, and, and that's within gold. And then I also want to do that into other assets. And so that really comes through in having like an allocation plan. And where I see most people, and, and this is a good point to bring up right here. This is where I see the problem that most people have. And a lot of people are probably even watching this, like you said, a lot of people are more sophisticated, but um, a lot of people are, might be looking for that next great gold or silver miner, that next great stock, that crypto, whatever it is. And they think if they can just get that one asset that goes up, you know, a thousand percent, that's going to be everything. Mm. But the thing is, is that most people haven't really taken the time to stand back and go, what's my goal? What am I trying to achieve? When, when am I trying to achieve it? What does that look like specifically? Like I want $3,000 a month of income in the next five years, or I want $1 million saved up in 15 years. Like what is the goal? Okay. So that's, that's the first part. And if you were using Google maps or anything, you put in your destination and then where am I today? Mm. And you have to take an honest assessment of where I am. What assets do I have? How much? What allocations? What percent? Where am I at today? 
And then you need to make that plan. If I was on Google Maps, it'd ask me if I'm walking or riding a bike or driving a car. Do I want to make any stops along the way? And so then it makes that plan. So a lot of people need to go back and figure out where am I trying to go? Where am I today? And what's my plan? And then that will help uh, answer these other questions like you just mentioned, like how do we take profits? Where do we put those other profits to? Well, it mm -hmm. depends. It depends on what your goal is. For me, my end goal has been to live off passive income from my real estate investments. So I look at a lot of my profits I'm making and I take those profits and put them into real estate because that for me is my goal, but that may not be your goal. Yeah, no, that's uh, thank you for sharing that because it's super important. And especially now as the resource market heats up, becomes more frothy, people get more excited, there's more hype. It's it's super attractive to individuals who don't have experience and they see someone they know get the 10 bagger and they think all I have to do is pick the right stock and that's the retirement plan. It's uh, it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's a go broke fast scheme if you're not paying attention. So it's a great place yeah, and, to build and, wealth and, and, slowly. And, and to that point, right, we see this all the time, right? We've seen the endless cases of, of musicians or rappers or, or football players, um, lottery winners that go broke, 